just going to take you out and buy you a Cadillac tonight. <laughs> wow. She decided to come anyway. <laughs> well, I can remember when we did a whole series of speak outs on women's issues, actually in Arlington, uh -huh. and uh, got the delegates from Northern Virginia to come and listen to women who had experienced violence or rape. Whatever. And I do not remember, somebody arranged a church for us to go to, and I, being a Quaker and not terribly good on all the varieties of Protestants and whatever that there are, and it did not occur to me that there would be a problem until the priest called me and said, you cannot be in our church. What? And, and so I said, uh, explain this to me. Mm -hmm. tell me. Tell me what's going on. And he said, we are moral opposition to each other. It was, it was one of the small Catholic churches in South Arlington. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, well, you know, we're going to talk mostly about violence. And about what? Violence. Violence. And um, mm -hmm. the need to change some of the evidentiary laws. And he just kind of got hysterical. And so I called a couple of women who were in his parish. And two days before the meeting, he decided we actually could be there and it would be all right. But it was one of those kind of amazing conversations, you know, in which we were just going like this. I don't, re and I was trying to remember who arranged that particular place for us. But we did actually do it. And I was amazed because the speak outs that we had on just a whole variety of topics, mm -hmm. um, I think were extremely effective because women came and told their stories and our lives were political and what was happening to us, you know, there was not a line between the personal and the political. And the effects of some of the discrimination that women had faced legit were enormous. And I think so truly that some of those delegates in the early days didn't really have a sense that we might be coming from a point of moral correctness, mm -hmm. or that the distress that we were feeling should have been listened to, or that they should have paid attention. And I think those were some very effective meetings, because women just came, filled the sanctuary, and then one by one just came up and told their stories. And it was very powerful. It was very powerful. And so we had CR on one level in our own learning with each other. CR is consciousness raising. But we also had these points of contact where we just invited women in to talk and tell their stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think it built, built among us also a stronger sense of community in the early days. Because we could see that the things that we were fighting and suffering from and trying to respond to weren't just carried by us as a small group of people, but it really was women we were speaking for. And I think that was a, a powerful approval, never done in a formal sense, but I think it was very, very real. So much of the time, I think, we, we felt that we were speaking for women who couldn't speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. like, well, so in some cases couldn't, you know, because they, uh, and some cases wouldn't, but especially the ones who couldn't speak for themselves because they were too dependent on, on men. They, maybe they were working three jobs or yeah, that two I, jobs yeah. and didn't have an opportunity to come to now meetings, an opportunity to, to pick it or do the things that we did. It, it, in many ways, we felt privileged that it was a privilege to speak for other women. I always felt I could be far out and radical because I was self-employed. Nobody could fire me or <laughs> talk to me about my behavior. And that was important because mm -hmm. that gave me the freedom mm -hmm. that I needed. Yeah. Do you remember the days when we would, well, I remember the days when we would discuss what we should put on our resume? <laughs> should we put our now membership on our resume? You know, what, what, how, how should we do this? And um, not on your tombstone. <laughs> no, no, it, it was. Best no, we, we had one, and we swore that the one thing that would not be on any of our tombstones was she was nice. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> she was nice? Yes. Yes. Not the other two. Yeah. So it's yeah. not nice. I, I remember deciding after, after Alexandria. Uh, by the way, for, for we had campaign ribbons, Battle of First Alexandria, Battle of Second Alexandria, Fairfax <laughs> 19, you know, about whatever. But uh, after Alexandria, putting um, political, rather than saying now, but I made it very clear that I did political organizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I still do that. You know, I mean, if you don't want a political organizer, you, you, you better look out. <laughs> and uh, I, I think I later, somewhat later, somewhere in the mid 80s or late 80s, I guess, a very similar discussion came up. Because it was said that if, if you listed on your jury selection form that you're a member of now, you were automatically taken off the jury. You didn't know you weren't funny. And so, and much later, we had a very similar discussion about dyeing one's hair. Mm -hmm. You know, should you, in terms of, of um, but uh, this wasn't, again, in terms of employment. Should you go ahead and leave your hair gray, mm -hmm. or should you dye it so that you could get the job? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what? <laughs> Where does that mess Yeah. Uh, well, and the practical, I mean, the, the combination of ethics and practicality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I always admired the work that you did with Wider Opportunities for Women. Oh, that was fun. Because that was just so mind boggling. That was good fun. We, we trained women for non traditional work. Not because it was all that radical, but because that's how you could get health insurance for your kids. And Many years later, or several years later, I was playing bridge with Catherine East, a wonderful Arlington feminist who was our mole in the labor department. And mm -hmm. Catherine said, oh, I founded Wider Opportunity. I was one of the co-founders. Catherine was one of the co-founders of almost everything, I believe. <laughs> um, the midwife now, by the yes. way. Yes, <laughs> and uh, she said, I was one of the founders, but they got so middle class. I said, oh, no, they're not middle class anymore. <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> you know? Because at that point we were primarily training uh, very, very poor women in, in uh, Washington, and uh, at one point everybody, every woman who worked for the gas company, every woman who worked for the power and light company, and every woman who worked for Metro was ours. Mm -hmm. wow. you know, come through our training program. So they couldn't get in. They couldn't get into uh, the telephone company. Mm -hmm. For example. It was extremely common to have various aptitude tests mm -hmm. in, in all these jobs. And we did a little bit of research, and we discovered that um, the mechanical aptitude tests had been normed on men in World War II, and measured, in fact, the mechanical aptitude in men, and measured the IQ in women, IQ in education. Um, and a little bit of practice went a long way, it, you know, which we were talking ethics, you know. Uh, and the same was true, um, I think it was CNP Telephone and a couple of other companies had the most incredible vocabulary tests for, for trade jobs. And we, as a, as a training group, just debriefed every trainee who came back having taken the employment test. We, okay, what, what, what words did you get? And they would list them all. And we never said that you will see this on an employment test, but boy, they sure were on our vocabulary list. Mm -hmm. And they were really important words for trade jobs. Things like pinnacle. <laughs> you know that a lineman for, for the telephone company says, I'm going to climb to the pinnacle of that telephone yeah. <laughs> Well, that's one of the reasons that uh, I, I started uh, the now Legal Education and Defense Fund, LDEF. Um, Basically, what I used it for, I, I was also amending the now uh, hotline and complaint line, so that people who felt that they had a problem would, would call and I would, my job was referring them to jobs, I mean, to organizations and uh, lawyers frequently. I did a lot of legal referrals uh, for the various issues that they were facing. But the basic thing was, um, very often, somebody would complain about discrimination of some sort, and I would follow it up, and I would say to the, uh, when I called the person or the organization that was having a problem and found the right person to talk to, I'd say, well, I'm uh, representing the National Organization for Women, and I understand there's a problem here with somebody who feels that you have discriminated against them. Uh, I'd like to 
talk to you about it, but I'm not a lawyer, and I will uh, refer this to the Legal Defense and Education Fund. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, those words, that's all I said. I mean, I'm a nice lady, and that's all I said. Mary, I had a profound, could you speak just a little louder into that tape recording? Had a could profound? You no, no, the, the oh, sentence the nice before lady. that. Can you say that with a straight face? <laughs> you ought to know better. You know what a lady is. It's a nonsense word used in yodeling. A lady, a lady, a lady. <laughs> but basically, it had a profound effect on, on, the, on the conversation because Legal Defense and Education Fund that I have set up, I mean, it, and we had lawyers that were willing to do it, and we had money in the bank. I put ten thousand dollars in a bank account called LDE, my own money, called LDEF, just so I could say it was there and we were ready to use it. <laughs> and I, the threat, the threat of the of action against them and the publicity that I promised them we would be glad to help them get, absolutely worked. I never ever spent a nickel out of that fund. <laughs> well, and do you remember when Cornelia used the, your fund also with the Reston when she had been working on Title IX for so long and finally, you know, they got the law and then lo and behold, the softball league over in Reston was not allowing girls to use the public field. And the so... The taxpayer paid for public, public. field. Public. Yes, the taxpayer paid for public field. And Cornelia used that with such grace. You know, to the Fairfax Board of Supervisors and to various people. And it was hysterical how fast those oh. folks moved because it was, but they didn't. They <laughs> the mythical marching It was the <laughs> mythical marching million. It worked very well because they had not felt threatened before. And it was a real threat. I mean, if they disagreed, yes, in fact, the money was in the account and it would be used. But... And, 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 of course, it would be publicized. Yes. I made a point to them that, of course, this is a very interesting case, and we need to get the word out to organizations about how it's progressing. And that mm -hmm. thought, because they knew what they were doing was discriminatory. They didn't think anybody would stand up and tell them who they were and where they could go. At about that time, the Men's High School Coaching Association heard about Title IX. So they, being forward-thinking men, <laughs> decided they would simply, and they announced, they were simply taking over coaching of all girls' high school sports. Mm -hmm. And they mm -hmm. did. Well, they did get a letter from now, and it was forever after known as, it would grieve us to be forced to sue mm -hmm. you. Was one of the lines in the letter. Well, so they backed down at that point. Now that's going other places. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you go, you go tenured the professors yes. were no longer coaches. Yes. Uh, that was University of Richmond was the case. No, the, 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 no this was at the high school. This was the high school. simply said, we are taking County. over all the coaching of women's teams, mm -hmm. period, because they knew money was going to come into the high schools, and they wanted control of the money. Prior to that, they hadn't, didn't care because there was no money. Mm -hmm. It was all bake sales. and. Um, and, and the letter was written, I believe, from Northern Virginia. Yes. It was. It, yes. it's, and and the, the line was, it would grieve us to be forced. We, we hate to do it, but we will. So, Mary, you made up the Legal Defense Fund. It's not, not the Virginia oh, no. one. No, it wasn't. At, uh, well, I, had ten, I put $10,000 in a bank account and labeled it Legal Defense and Education Fund. But you made that up. What do you mean made it up? It was a threat, and it would have been used. No, I mean, but it was, didn't exist until you made it. It wasn't oh, a corporation. I, it was a, it was a bank account, not a not big organization. No, but nobody knew that. Well, yeah, absolutely. And so it got, it got used extensively. <laughs> but I mean, did it disappear later? Because I, you know. What was her Oh, you want the money? Is that? No, no, no. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I'm asking, did it disappear? Or did it evolve into something? It did be. I used it as long as I was involved in Northern Virginia now. Okay, and then it just you just took it away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. You know the, the joke. I I'd forgotten about the mythical marching millions. I mean, there what was that time when we terrified people? And, yes, we did. And we weren't that big, and we weren't that organized. 
<laughs> but Cornelia um, once asked the superintendent of schools Jack, yeah. how big he thought her education task force was. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I think two or 300. The whole chapter wasn't 200. <laughs> and, and somebody, you know, so they would ask Cornelia how big is Oh, I couldn't count them. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and Cornelia was the one that gave us the instructions before going into Jack's office that we were not to use any body language that gave him the slightest idea that we didn't represent every single woman. Do you know who Cornelia was? No. Nope. She was a lady, not one of us. She was a beautifully <laughs> cloth, she was a pick elegantly she was a dressed, and had the mannerisms of a lady. She was yeah. one of those first families in Virginia. Yeah, she was a, and she, she was, was an sure. FFV, and she her was mother a had invented so And uh, he was, I think, a press person in Washington. Oh, that's uh, funny. A White House correspondent. But basically, the name, of course, had a lot of impressed people very much. But deep down, inside Cornelia, she was one of us. Oh, was she? Ever? And when we would find issues like that, she was, you know, we, we, we played her, but with her permission and, and interest in because we found the issues. And the fact that a Cornelia Solar was going to be concerned about this issue. And so it's it, too many it was connections. wonderful. <laughs> She was uh, about 10 years older than most of us, so we called her mother. I didn't. <laughs> well, do you think any of us would have been brave enough to call her corny? You <laughs> tried once calling her corny. You're older than some of us. It did not go over well. It did not go over well. She was the type of person who, during the Depression, refused to have the obligatory coming out party because it was a waste of money and people in Virginia were starving. I mean, she came from, she had money, don't misunderstand, but she... Yes, their farm, Genalia, is now the development the and the whole thing. Well, Xerox. 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 Oh. And uh, there... Oh, and there's a Genalia so bull. That beautiful, beautiful place. Beautiful wow. house, too. Beautiful house. But, now, I, I have a story about the mythical marching millions. In uh, 1976, uh, now was in a really low period because we were having a tension with each other about who we were and, and whether we were radical or whether we were more status quo. Uh, and we had terrible, terrible budget cuts. Uh, I was, had a co-chair then of what was called the Women and Religions Task Force of National Now. We had a budget of, I think, $300. Uh, the uh, general, uh, the Episcopal General Convention was meeting in Minneapolis. Uh, my co-chair was studying for the Episcopal priesthood, so she sort of doubled our budget. So she and I could go to Minneapolis and demonstrate for the ordination of women. Uh, we found a woman locally in Minneapolis to be our local contact, so we had a three-person task force three-person task force, and we were spending 200% of our budget. Uh, <laughs> and um, one, I, I remember earlier on I told you that there were these separate groups that were working on ordination that didn't necessarily talk to each other. Well, one of the more status quo ones was headed by a woman in Texas. Um, and she's the one that actually sent out a dress code to all of the women working on ordination that we wanted to be dressed properly because we didn't want to find ordination defeated because some of us might were wearing blue jeans or something like that. So she had sent out this dress code, which you know, I boggled my mind. But at any rate, <laughs> the word sort of came to me through the Episcopal grapevine that she was very concerned about hearing that there would be a presence of national now at her general conference. Oh. Three of us, right? Orange. The presence of national now. So the word came to me that in her concern, she wanted to talk with me. So I called her in Texas, collect. <laughs> <laughs> There's a message there. <laughs> And I said, I, I heard you would like to talk with me, and I hope I haven't called too late. Oh, I know, it's just the shank on the evening. 
And, and she said, well, um, Georgia, this is, I just want to check things out. Um,